G'day folks and welcome to this Rules Primer for Nations in Arms, designed by Stanislaw Thomas and published by Compass Games. This Rules Primer is designed to complement the rulebook, specifically the second printing of the rulebook. It doesn't replace those rules, but rather the aim here is that you can watch through this video, grasp an understanding of the fundamentals of gameplay, and then more easily work through the rulebook and get going with the game. This is a two to seven player game. Gameplay is oriented around a chit draw mechanism where each round you draw a little counter out of a cup and this drives the forces that uh, a player will activate on their turn, whether it's the French Empire or coalition forces. Various leaders may be activated, they'll move around this map, they may lay siege to enemy fortresses or uh, engage in battle with other enemy forces. But along the way, you're also managing the composition of your forces. You're maneuvering through various types of terrain. Uh, you're managing your supply chains and various other things. And I'll try to cover the fundamentals of that gameplay in this video. So in this first video, I'll talk about the, the different game units that you'll encounter. Uh, we'll talk about the initiative phase and how sort of gameplay uh, typically runs through. We'll talk about uh, different types of forces, stacking, and the ranks on your different units. We'll talk about the, the fundamentals of movement and interception. Uh, and then I'll briefly cover naval forces and naval movement towards the end of this video. And I'll cover things like supply attrition and, and combat and sieges in uh, a subsequent video. Now to explain these rules, I'll be using the setup for the 1800 introductory scenario, Marengo. It's recommended that you start with this. The playbook includes a playthrough of this scenario, but it doesn't provide details on how everything works. So I'm going to sort of explain the background to, to what's happening and, and how the units function. Now in this scenario, we have the, uh, the blue units are French. We have the gray units uh, Austrian. And then there are a few scattered British uh, forces, including their land forces and their naval forces around the area. This also includes some Hanoverians way up north, and the French also have some Dutch allies up there. There are over a dozen different uh, types of combat units in the game. Uh, these can include uh, guerrillas, janissaries, uh, Cossacks and so forth. I'm just going to focus on some of the main types of units that you'll encounter in a typical scenario. So here we have some of the most common units you'll encounter in the game. What we have here in particular is an infantry corps, in this case the 15th corps. On its front side it is a two-step unit and each step is worth one combat point. So in effect this unit, two steps, has two combat points. Now we know it's a two-step unit because it has these little white dots between these values. If this unit becomes reduced, you'll note that there are red dots. Now it's a one-step unit worth just one combat point. This works the same way with cavalry, as you can see down here. It's a two-step unit. It has white dots. It can become reduced down to one step, red dots. And cavalry, in addition to saying cavalry along the top, has these little saber icons on the left. And these are all also on the cavalry leader counters, which I'll point out in a moment. Now, detachments are much the same, except they're much smaller forces. You'll note the red dots indicate they're just a one step unit. And so they're blank on their reverse side, indicating that uh, if they take a step, they're removed. And of course, if uh, a two-step unit takes a step, it's reduced, another step, and it's removed. In addition to those combat units, there are also some support units, which you'll encounter in the first scenario. These are engineers, and they can help you during sieges by adding a siege modifier, this little one out on the left. They can also be used to help you cross rivers by their bridge side. And then you also have uh, these supply units, supply trains, which move around with your forces, and supply depots. Now both engineers and trains are eliminated 
if uh, attacked by enemy units when they're alone. But supply depots provide half a combat point when they're attacked alone. So they do provide some very minor defensive benefit. And I'll get to what these do in just a moment. In addition to the number of steps and combat points, units also have three values down the bottom. First of all, they have their combat modifier, in this case, zeros. But uh, during combat, which I'll get to later, you designate a lead assault unit. This will be the first unit to take casualties. And you use that lead assault unit's combat modifier in the combat. And again, I'll explain how combat works at a later stage. In the center, you have the artillery value. Uh, and in short, this can help provide artillery superiority for your side. And again, I'll explain that later. And finally, you have the morale of the unit. Now, morale is used to determine your overall force morale in combat. It's a little bit tricky, and I'll explain that again later when we get to combat. But you'll notice that all these forces, including the depots, have morale values, which factor into uh, that force morale calculation. Now, you'll note that uh, bridges don't offer any combat value uh, or artillery or morale. Engineers contribute that siege point, as I mentioned, and depots have that half combat point and full morale. Now, just to clarify, on these depots, that half there indicates a half combat point. It serves more as a reminder. They don't uh, actually add a combat modifier. It's not a half combat modifier. These are combat modifiers, zero, and these will usually show a, for example, plus one, plus two, or plus three. Just a reminder, this is not a plus half, although it's in the same place. So you may occasionally encounter these units um, alone in a hex. Detachments in particular, uh, they help forge uh, supply links and they can be detached from an army uh, and left behind. Infantry too can be by themselves, but for the most part, infantry form uh, stacks under leaders or become parts of armies. And that's why at the start of this uh, scenario, almost all your forces are either under leaders or they're parts of larger armies. If I were to explore this stack, it would have some infantry, perhaps some cavalry, all under the command of this leader. You'll also notice a few detachments separated from those, and I'll explain how those work in just a moment. But again, keep in mind, you may have isolated core moving around by themselves, which they can do with some restrictions. And you can have these isolated detachments, which may be separated from a force. Uh, and they can, again, move around by themselves with some restrictions. Leaders play an important role in the game. They enable you to effectively take control of various corps of different types, infantry and cavalry and so forth, and to coordinate the movement of those forces together. There are also armies, which I'll talk about in just a moment. They work slightly differently. When a leader takes command of a force, that leader can command, or effectively stack, units with them equal to twice their star rating or rank. So a two-star leader, double that, is four, can take command of four steps. And if I lift this leader up, you'll note he has two steps of infantry, one step of cavalry, note the red dot, and a train, which doesn't count towards stacking limitations. Whilst that leader is stacked with those units, he can move with those units. Most units in the game, including those that I've discussed thus far, have a movement value of six. If a leader moves by themselves, they have a movement value of eight. And there are some subtle differences with some of the other units. Some have slightly more or slightly fewer movement points. In this scenario, most of your leaders are two-star leaders, and they'll command four steps without an army. But um, just as a heads up as well, your three-star leaders, uh, such as Moore here, are kind of like your elite leaders. And in addition to commanding six steps in a stack, they can also stack with a, uh, a subordinate leader with one or two stars. Now, without a leader, you can only have one combat unit. So only one detachment can stack in a hex without a leader. And these two detachments can't stack together. That would apply to a core as well. You can't have two core in the same hex without a leader or a core with a detachment. 
as you might gather, leaders are relatively limited in the size of the forces they can command. In this case, four steps doesn't provide you with very much. It's perhaps two full strength infantry corps. Fortunately, this is where armies come into play. Here we have the Austrian army of Italy, and up in the top left, the French army of Italy. Armies, and in particular their army commanders, facilitate the command of much larger forces. And again, within those armies, those larger forces can move around quite freely. There are several particular features of armies which makes them powerful. First of all, you have their artillery value. You'll notice the Army of Italy has an artillery value of two. It's the only number on the encounter that shows they add two artillery. But below them, you have their army leader. In this case, Miller. He has an army command capacity in the center of the backside of his hex. And this indicates how many steps he can command under this army. In this case, 16 steps. You'll note that this is significantly larger than the six steps he would normally be able to command if he were a leader by himself. And it's that army counter which facilitates that much larger command capacity. Now because armies can be quite large forces and 16 steps could create quite a high stack in these hexes, we simply place the army counter, the leader, any of these support units below them, and all their combat units go off in a separate army box on the edge of the map. And this serves several purposes. Firstly, I think foremost, it reduces these very massive stacks. Secondly, it adds a bit of a fog of war element um, to the game. So for the most part, your maneuvers around Europe will take place with your armies, with your forces under leaders. These two components at the front of the fighting. And then perhaps behind the lines, you'll have your detachments and perhaps the one or two core. But this is really the focus of your uh, attention throughout the scenarios. There are some other elements of leader counters which uh, we need to point out. First of all, the first number you can see on a leader is their initiative rating. And this determines when they can activate during a turn. Nations in Arms, of course, uses a chit pull mechanism to activate these leaders to move and the leader must have an initiative rating equal to or higher than that drawn chit to activate. I'll talk about that more in a moment. The final value is a combat modifier and obviously the better leaders like Bonaparte have a higher combat modifier and again the second number is their potential for army command. If there's an X it means they can't take command of an army. Fleets, as denoted by the anchor symbol and the little shaded light blue base to these counters, are slightly different. The first number indicates the leader's manoeuvre factor. The last number indicates their uh, tactical bonus. And again, you can see the X through the middle there. They don't command armies. And I'll explain how these work later on. Now, there aren't many uh, allied forces in this scenario, but just as a heads up as well, you can stack allied forces with those major power forces, provided they, they meet stacking requirements. The limitation is mainly on armies, where at least half of the steps in an army must be of the, um, the same nationality as the army counter. So in a French army, at least half the steps must be French units. In an Austrian army, at least half the steps must be Austrian. And the other steps can be made up of those, um, those other allies. So it's fine for those elite uh, three-star commanders to have a subordinate of fewer stars. So you can have a three-star leader with, uh, stacked with a leader with two stars or one star. You cannot, however, have two two-star leaders or two one-star leaders stacked together. If their armies ever merge, and I'll talk about that in a moment, you have to remove one of the leaders. So there's only ever one leader of that rank. This, however, is, is different in an army. If you've got an army under your army commander, three stars here, he can have up to four subordinate leaders. And the idea here is he's, he's moving this large army around. He can detach perhaps a two-star leader with several steps to head off in a different direction. Um, and then perhaps remerge later on.
And of course, you always, always need to make sure that the uh, the highest star leader has seniority of command. So you can't have a three star leader under the command of a two star leader. Now, for the most part, once a leader is in command of a, a small force, they'll re remain in command. Uh, there are only a few circumstances in which they'll be removed from the board. That is, if uh, a superior leader takes command of that force, perhaps if that leader merges with uh, an army and uh, they may become subordinate with, under that uh, army commander or they may be removed if there's not room within that army. And of course, if they suffer defeat in battle, the commander is uh, instantly dismissed and returns to the leader pool. Just keep in mind that um, sovereigns, uh, of which I don't think there are any in this scenario, are only dismissed if they suffer a defeat in a major battle. But I'll talk about that more later on. Now, if for some reason you're really unhappy with a particular leader you have on the board, perhaps he's failing in battle or you're just not happy with the situation, you can voluntarily dismiss uh, a leader. And that can include an army commander as well. Uh, that happens during the uh, leader deployment step of the economy phase. It can't happen sort of midway through a campaign. Things are too hectic to be uh, dismissing and uh, reallocating leaders at that stage. They're basically again placed back in the leader pool and uh, you replace them. Okay, so with that established, let's talk about how the game works. At the start of a scenario, you'll place the uh, activation markers, that look like this, into a cup. Uh, the scenario may instruct you to remove certain markers and in this 1800 introductory scenario, you should remove the neutral land, neutral naval, Empire Naval 2, Coalition Naval 2, and Winter Quarters Markers. So we're really just focused mainly on some coalition, uh, the, uh, the land markers and uh, a couple of naval markers, which will come out. Typically during the activation phase, you'll simply draw the next counter at random from this cup and resolve its effects, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But in this introductory scenario, we're told that France has the initiative at the start of the scenario and then can thus select any counter they want. It can be a friendly counter or an enemy counter. If you work through the sample, we're told that France wants to draw Empire Land 4. This basically means they can activate their leaders with an initiative rating of 4 or greater. And again, just as a reminder, the initiative rating is the first number on these counters. So this is a rather restrictive activation counter, but at least it gets their hardest counter, the most difficult counter to activate the leaders out of the way. And of course, our attention is drawn to Bonaparte with an initiative rating of five, and thus he is able to activate. Now there are several things to, uh, to point out with regards to these counters. First of all, you activate the leaders of the involved side. So if this was an Empire Land 1, I could in effect activate all leaders with an initiative rating of 1 or more. A leader will activate, perform their actions. At the end of their activation, we place a first activation marker, if it's an army, to show they've taken their activation. Or if it's just a leader by themselves, we flip them over to their reverse side to show they've taken their activation. And once they've completed a first activation or have been flipped, these units are still eligible to be activated a second time if, uh, if that uh, activation counter meets their initiative. However, any subsequent activation will be subject to uh, an attrition check. Basically, you roll on the attrition table and apply any modifiers. I'll talk about that later. And then you either flip this first activation to show activation over, or you place an activation over above that leader, again to indicate activation over. During the course of the campaign, you'll, you'll suffer step losses to uh, units within your forces. And one of the ways to replenish those step losses is through what's known as absorption. This is where a force can absorb the steps of smaller units. So for example, this force under Ott can move to this detachment up in the north and on their way through, they can absorb the steps, in this case, just one step of that attachment and build a step in one of their reduced core in this force. 
And again, this can be part of their movement or at the end of movement. And when absorbing a force, combat units can only absorb those steps if the combat modifiers of those forces are at most a difference of one. So a zero or a plus one infantry core in this force could absorb this plus zero detachment. A unit, let's say the guards with a plus three, could not absorb this detachment because the difference is more than one. And just to clarify, steps from a major country and from allied minor countries can be absorbed into forces from the allied major power and allied minor powers, provided the combat units belong to the same production type. And that process of absorption costs one movement point from the, uh, the force being moved and absorbing those steps. Now, another way to, uh, to build up your forces and your armies is through what's known as integration. And this is where you will, in effect, integrate the forces of a small force into a larger force. So this is uh, Bonaparte's army of Italy, if we were to move through here. Bonaparte's army of Italy could integrate the forces of Muncie's force here. Now, unlike absorption, there's no uh, modification of steps here. The, the, the uh, forces being integrated are simply moved into the, uh, the integrating force. Again, this costs movement points, but this depends on uh, what is being integrated. So a, uh, a core level force like this could be integrated into this army the cost of one movement point. And again, this can take place during a move or at the end of movement. An army can also be integrated into another army at a cost of two movement points, thus forming what's known as an army group. And support units and leaders may be integrated into a moving stack at a cost of zero movement points. And unlike absorption, there is contamination of activation. So if this army were to integrate this force and they had an activation over marker on them, this army would uh, be contaminated by this and also take on the activation over marker. Okay, let's talk about the specifics of, uh, of movement and activation. And I'll start with armies. Now these are a bit of a special case again. When an army commander activates um, well, his area, he activates both his hex and he may uh, activate surrounding hexes, surrounding forces in uh, these neighbouring hexes to in effect be drawn and integrated into that, uh, that army hex. The cost for, let's just say Monty is down here, the cost for them to do so, for Monty to be integrated into Bonaparte's force here, his army, must be no more than two movement points. That's to move into that hex. You simply place these uh, Monty's force into the hex and um, reduce the movement point of, uh, of that army. So this Monty moving here counts against that army's movement point. Now, of course, you must meet, uh, I guess, stacking requirements and leader requirements. So at present, Bonaparte's army of Italy has three subordinate leaders, so he would be able to accommodate Monty, but no additional leaders in his force. And as this is a form of integration, there is, of course, contamination of activations. So if Bonaparte integrates Monty's force, at the end of this, they are all flipped over to activation over. Now, once activated, an army or a smaller force or even individual units can basically move around the map and pay the movement costs per hex they move until they've expended all their movement points. Or, of course, if a leader has uh, lost a battle of any size, he has to cease movement. Now, along the way, that, uh, that force or that army can drop off detachments. Uh, to drop off detachments, you simply spend a step from a unit within that force or army. It's free to do so. It doesn't cost any movement points to drop off those detachments. And again, this is important for supply links, which I'll get to later on. And of course, in addition to dropping off detachments, as I kind of hinted at earlier, 
uh, an army commander may want to drop off smaller forces under the command of a uh, subordinate leader. And again, that's all free to do so along their movement path. Now, of course, one of the main purposes of movement is to engage with the enemy. I mentioned it before, but just a reminder that uh, if your force moves into a hex solely occupied by an enemy train or engineering unit, uh, whether it's an engineer or bridge uh, mode, that unit is destroyed. Now, again, just to clarify, this is different if there is a depot, which does have some well, half combat point uh, in defence. Now, when you move into an enemy hex, you designate the point of contact, and there is this contact marker to indicate the hex side through which you've entered this area. Now, this hex and the two adjacent hexes are referred to as the contact area, and no combat avoidance is possible by the defender through those three areas, the contact hex and the two adjacent ones. As I said earlier, most combat units have a movement value of six, but they can extend this by up to half, provided they uh, don't move adjacent to uh, enemy units, they don't enter an unbesieged enemy fortress, and they don't do anything else other than movement, uh, absorption, integration, and perhaps dropping off units along the way. So as long as they're focused on those movement actions and associated actions like integration, absorption, they can move up to half their movement allowance extra. However, they must, at the end of that movement, undertake a mandatory attrition check, even if this is just their first activation. Now, as the forces of one side gradually move around the map, there is possible interception by their enemy. The interception zone of a force is all six surrounding hexes, provided that doesn't cross an unbridged river. I'll get to engineers in a moment. As soon as an enemy force moves into that interception zone, this force can attempt to intercept. They roll on, uh, basically they need to roll 2d6 and get a 10 or more, but there are various modifiers that apply to this. If they succeed in rolling that 10 or more, they intercept in this hex, and get a plus one combat modifier in this first round of combat. The active force is still considered the attacker, they've just been intercepted in this hex. And again, keep in mind there are various modifiers that apply to this, including uh, initiative modifiers, uh, cavalry modifiers, and uh, a few other small ones. Now, interception is possible across a bridged river. It's also possible if a force has engineers with it, or if you're intercepting with an army. Armies have uh, intrinsic engineers, so anything you can do with uh, engineers you can do with an army. They're considered to have engineers. However, uh, there is a negative three penalty to that interception attempt um, across that river um, with those engineers. If that interception roll is successful, if you roll a, a modified 10 or more, at least one core from the force, and it may be in this case your entire force, must intercept into that area. If you've got a larger force, you can just send one almost sacrificial core across to uh, delay the enemy and try and fight them. You don't have to send your entire force uh, over into that uh, intercepted hex. And a reminder that, that uh, the interception area is all six adjacent areas, keep in mind those bridges and unbridged river hexes and so forth, but you can also of course intercept into areas occupied by friendly forces. So if the army of Italy was here and the French tried to move here, Ott's force could intercept into uh, this space. Now, just to cover a bit of an edge case, you can attempt to intercept with, I guess, multiple forces, multiple leaders, but only one of them can be successful. So if Monsi moves down into here, the, uh, the Austrian player can decide what force he wants to intercept with first. Let's say he tries the army of Italy, and uh, he fails, he can then attempt with Ott, and Ott may eventually intercept into here. However, if he succeeds with this army of Italy, and then may they, they uh, intercept into there, he's had one success, he can no longer attempt to intercept with the army of Ott. They'll have to join the battle by uh, marching to the sound of guns, which I'll cover 
later on. Now to return to the situation up in the north near Hanover. Augereau has attacked Brock's force here. Uh, let's say they failed their interception and Augereau is about to move into here. Brock can attempt to avoid battle, keeping in mind he can't avoid into these three hexes. So he can avoid into these three hexes or he can avoid battle by withdrawing into the fortress for free. That's an automatic success if he withdraws uh, or avoids battle rather into the fortress. If he doesn't want to do that, well, he, of course he can choose to fight the battle. If he wants to avoid battle into one of these three hexes, he needs to make a combat avoidance check. And this is another 2d6 roll requiring a 10 or more. And again, with various modifiers applied, such as initiative, terrain, uh, cavalry, um, crossing rivers again, and, and so forth. Now you must have uh, either have a leader present in that force to attempt this combat avoidance check, or the forces must be Cossacks or guerrillas. Cossacks and guerrillas can uh, do a combat avoidance check without a leader. If the defending unit is demoralized and they want to avoid combat, that, uh, that check is automatically successful. Combat avoidance check may, uh, may also be automatically successful if the defending player attempting this check uh, only has cavalry unit, provided the phasing player doesn't have cavalry. If the phasing player only has undemoralized cavalry units, they cancel that automatic avoidance. Think of this as cavalry quickly escaping from a force with infantry, but if the attacker only has cavalry, they chase them down and prevent that check from automatically succeeding. Should that check succeed, the defending unit needs to retreat into an adjacent area. It can't be a contact area again, it's the third time I've said that. Uh, it can't be occupied by an enemy unit. It can't even be in the uh, the area of influence of another enemy unit. You also can't cross uh, unbridged river hex sites unless you have engineers, and again, unless you're an army because of those intrinsic engineers. Now that combat avoidance is, uh, well, for a start, it's difficult to achieve and it's not without its risks. If you, even if you succeed in avoiding combat, let's say Brock retreats up here instead of into the fortress, which would be automatic, the phasing player can uh, pursue, and if they have movement points left, continue to, to move and perhaps uh, attempt to attack once again. If you fail that combat avoidance check, you suffer a minus one uh, dice roll modifier during the first round of combat. Now for the most part, if the phasing player moves a, a force or an army into a hex that is occupied by enemy units, there'll be combat or a siege. But if the phasing player moves a force or an army into a hex occupied by enemy units without a fortification, and without a fortification is key here, then there is an opportunity to overrun that enemy force. Now, of course, if there's a fortress there, the enemy can withdraw into the fortress. Uh, the enemy has an opportunity to avoid combat per the rules, as I've just kind of mentioned. But if they fail that, if there's no fortress, if they fail to avoid combat, and if the phasing player has a combat value, and this is mainly related to combat points and their steps, five times or greater than that enemy force, then they automatically overrun and eliminate that defending force. This costs one additional movement point to overrun, and once that force is eliminated, they can continue their moving, movement, their movement if they have uh, movement points left. And keeping in mind that things like trains, uh, engineers contribute nothing uh, towards this. Artillery points don't matter in this. It's all about the combat value of those moving forces needing to be five times or more greater than that defending force. Now, for reasons which I'll get to in a moment, much of your campaigning will also revolve around control of fortresses. And fortresses come uh, with a value of uh, one, there's a lot of ones around, two, such as in Metz, Liège, Antwerp, or three, such as down here in Mantua. A, a force or an army will generally need to stop upon entering a hex with a fortress unless they can drop off a screening force with steps equal to or, or greater than the, the value of that fortification. The exception to that is that value three fortresses 
require um, a, an army to be a, a, um, a screening force or to lay siege to them. Once you've um, dropped off that screening force or you're laying siege, you place a siege zero marker in that space. Now an unlimited number of uh, defender steps can stack inside a fortress. And we can see down here in Genoa, a level two fortification, we have a single step of infantry. This is again a reduced unit with the red dots. An unlimited number of French steps could defend inside that fortress. However, the fortress can only supply friendly units up to its value, in this case two. So that reduced infantry can be supplied, and they can go up to uh, two steps at full strength and still be supplied, but any excess steps that the French might have in there would have to uh, suffer an attrition check during um, the final attrition check phase. And just to reiterate the situation I mentioned earlier, if an attacker enters a hex with an enemy force in a fortress, that enemy force can automatically avoid battle into the fortress, and that'll be successful. They can attempt to avoid battle and retreat away from that space. But if they fail that, if they fail that combat avoidance check, they have to fight a battle. They don't get, then they can't then decide they want to enter the fortress. They've tried to avoid battle, they've failed, they fight a battle outside the fortress. Now fortress can only be besieged once there are no enemy units or, or forces friendly to that fortress outside the fortress. So to lay siege here, Brock will either have to be forced out of the area or be within the fortress. They can't be sitting outside. Now I've also spoken about some of the penalties of rivers and restrictions. If there's a bridge across the river, uh, those restrictions are largely lifted. There's no movement penalty to cross um, a bridged river. There is, however, a plus two movement cost to, uh, to move across an unbridged river here. Now, if you're moving with engineers, or again, an army with those intrinsic engineers, that penalty is reduced to just one additional movement point. Now, engineering units can uh, enhance this capability even further by flipping over to their bridge site. If they haven't moved, let's say they're here, and they haven't moved during their activation, and they're stacked with a leader, I'll be on this side, they can flip over, point to one river hex side in their hex. In this case, there's only one. Uh, but if there's multiple, let's say, up here, they have to point to one specific hex side. And they count it as bridging this, which reduces the cost of crossing that river down to zero movement points. And just in case you're thinking about invading England via these straits, you can't, because the English control the sea zone where this strait is located. And that's the same with all straits. You can only cross this if friendly fleets control the sea zone. If that's the case, it costs two additional movement points to cross over there. Okay, so we spent some time talking about uh, land units. Now it's time to talk about these naval units, these fleets. Now, fleets are just one step units. Uh, they don't have a, a reduced side once they they take a hit, they're eliminated. The fleets will have a, a name, typically the name of the the admiral who commanded that fleet, such as Cornwallis, Hood, Collingwood, and so forth. They'll have the naval commander's maneuver value shown on the left here. On the right, we see their combat factor, and of course their date of uh, entry or exit or use. And again, this reminder, there's a little anchor symbol and a little light, light blue bar down the bottom to show that they're a fleet. Now, the X in the center is common throughout all of these fleets. And uh, I think this is mainly a reminder that these are fleets and that these commanders can't serve as army commanders. The reverse of a fleet simply shows fleet and a reminder of their movement value. Now, you can have up to three fleets stacking together in a sea zone, in a blockade box, or in a harbour. And when grouped like this together, they're referred to as naval squadrons. So this is one naval squadron consisting of three fleets, 
This is another naval squadron consisting of two fleets and another one here consisting of two fleets. Naval squadron up here and another over to the left. So fleets are activated by the naval activation markers like this. Um, they're once activated, their movement is, is pretty easy. They have eight movement points. Uh, they can move, basically spend a movement point to move from C zone to C zone to C zone and so forth. They can spend a, a movement point to enter or exit a harbour uh, or to enter an enemy blockade box or an enemy harbour. Um, if they move into, let's say, a C zone, uh, you can activate your fleets or squadrons separately or together. So if these guys move into here, they can what's called aggregate another fleet into their squadron, like so. Uh, and doing so uh, simply costs them one extra movement point. Now when you uh, aggregate fleets together like that, the uh, highest ranking uh, officer takes command, similar to the, the land rules, you'll place the um, the, the fleet with the, the highest manoeuvre value um, as being in command. Now the situation may arise where uh, your fleets are in a harbour which is then captured by enemy land forces. If it happens, this fleet will need to uh, immediately basically put out to sea and end their movement in a friendly harbour within range of their, their movement factor. Again, eight for <laughs> pretty much every fleet I've seen. Um, in moving, however, enemy interceptions are possible, and I'll talk about that in, in just a moment. But if that fleet is blockaded, as in this um, example, that interception will be automatic. Otherwise, moving through these other sea zones, enemy forces will need to roll for that interception. If, for uh, whatever reason, that redeployment is not possible, those fleets are destroyed. So, when a fleet tries to move through a sea zone occupied by an enemy fleet, that enemy fleet can attempt to intercept. Um, pretty standard rule, they roll 2d6, needing a 10 or more to succeed. But to their die roll, they add the manoeuvre factor of the leader. Now, I mentioned that um, blockading ships will automatically uh, succeed in that attempt to intercept. When this happens, the fleets uh, move to the sea zone and the blockading fleets can also be moved to that sea zone. However, stacking must be obeyed at all times. In this case, there are five fleets in this area which is illegal. So they cannot join this, uh, this squadron of fleet, three fleets. If there are only two fleets here, the uh, intercepting force could move fleets up to stacking limit. So they could move one here to make three. That would be a legal move. They wouldn't be able to move two. And of course, following a successful interception, there'll be a naval battle in that sea zone with the intercepting force, not the phasing player, but the intercepting force uh, being the attacker. And again, that moving fleet can uh, attempt to avoid battle, avoid combat, just like a land battle. Uh, and once again, they need 2d6, uh, a roll of 10 or more, and they'd add the manoeuvre rating of the, uh, the fleet commander to that roll. Um, if they pass that combat avoidance, they can keep moving. If they fail, again, they, they, there'll be a, a combat in that space. Now, just to clarify as well, these um, blockade boxes provide kind of an exception to those interception rules. If, uh, let's say, a French fleet kind of tried to move through the Bay of Biscay and attack Cornwallis, um, Cornwallis cannot um, make an avoidance check. He has to fight here. Uh, it's the same when a force first moves into the, this, this blockade box. If a French fleet in the harbour wants to intercept, that interception is automatic. So fleets about to commence a blockade or in a blockade are kind of more vulnerable to combat. They can't avoid battle basically. They're sitting just outside the harbour and uh, are waiting basically for an attack. So if a, uh, a fleet wants to move into a blockade box, it costs an extra movement point. And as I said, 
uh, any fleet in the harbour can automatically intercept and there'll be a sea battle. If not, they simply retreat to the harbour and they can stay there. Now the effects of a blockade are that um, well, they automatically intercept any fleet leaving the harbour, as I mentioned. Um, no trade income can be received from a blockaded harbour and there's no sea supply through that harbour. Now, it's, it's sort of a long game, but if that fleet wants to attack that French fleet, they can enter the harbour and trigger a naval combat. The main uh, impact here is the, uh, the value of these defensive guns. Uh, each level of the fort will add a plus two dice roll modifier to those defending fleets, which is quite considerable, um, particularly if it's a level two fort, that's quite a lot. Fleets can also be used for naval transport across sea zones, and each, uh, each fleet unit can transport up to two combat points, um, plus one supply unit or one engineer unit or one army marker, plus any number of leaders. Now, if, uh, if a fleet is transporting those units and there's combat and they suffer step losses, you'll take those losses from the fleets not involved in the transport first, and only then do you start to take losses from the fleets transporting those units. When a, a fleet transporting those units is lost, they also lose their cargo. And it's um, up to the, the owning play to determine which of those fleets is lost. Now to transport units by naval transport, the land units must begin in a, uh, a harbour. And during the naval activation, the fleet will come into the harbour, pick up those units, and then begin transporting them by sea zones. Now an important rule here is that the the, uh, the land units must have arrived at their destination before the end of the activation phase or they are eliminated. So you want to make sure that you can um, get them on land quickly. If those units arrive in a, a friendly harbour, you simply drop them off in the harbour hex. If the destination hex is occupied by enemy units, this is considered a naval invasion. And there's automatically penalties. It's a negative three uh, dice roll modifier. Um, for this combat resolution. Now there's a special uh, invasion procedure for naval invasions. Basically, there is a special naval combat against the coastal batteries of the area. The assault units will land. There's a, a combat resolved uh, with the units outside the fortress. And then you get two siege attempts on that fortress. Now following that, uh, that second siege attempt, if the fortress is still not captured, the uh, invasion is repulsed and the surviving invaders are removed from the map and brought back into play as reinforcements during the next spring turn. The fleets are then placed in a sea area connected to the, uh, the invaded harbour. If the invasion is successful, the force is given a first activation marker and the fleet can enter the harbour. Okay, so that covers about half of the, the rules in the rulebook. We've gone through the different types of units, the, uh, the way the initiative phase works, uh, the different uh, types of forces you'll encounter and how stacking and rank works. And then we ran through movement and uh, naval rules, so naval movement, interception, and so forth. As I mentioned earlier, I will cover other rules like attrition, combat, supply, sieges, and so forth in uh, a subsequent video. Hopefully this has kind of got you started and, and grasping the, uh, the, the fundamentals of how gameplay works.